So we're going to start this session with a bang. Uh, we have Artur Chumai speaking on fast testing of graph properties. Artur is at the University of Warwick. Um, and I'm not going to give you a whole history because it's long <laughs> and brilliant. But, um, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, I'm really from the University of Warwick, and I want to tell you something about, uh, can you hear me well? Good. I want to tell you something about fast algorithms for testing graph properties. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to analyze process, big graphs. So in this talk, big data means big graph. And what we want to do is we want to study basic properties of big graphs uh, and analyze them, the structure. Uh, <coughs> so you know, this so Normally, when we're talking about graph algorithms, we think, OK, the graph consists of 50 or 5,000 nodes. Here, our focus is we want to study big graphs. We don't specify what does mean big. This is an example of graph which could be considered big. Uh, and for such graphs, as you may have heard yesterday's talk by Ronit, uh, we're very often interested in analyzing the properties, but want to do it very fast. By that, we mean in sublinear time which is the time faster than the time needed to read the entire input. Uh, and in this talk, we would like to study basic graph properties in the context of a framework of property testing. Uh, OK, so we have this big graph. And what are kind of properties we want to study? So here are some examples. We want to check if the graph has some big click or has some simple structure like a triangle? Or is the graph planar? Is a good expander? What are the basic properties that the graph has? Uh, what we know is that because we want to do it in time sublinear, which means we cannot process the entire graph at once, uh, we have to make some sacrifices. And in particular, we want to do approximation. We want to study some approximate conditions, properties of the graph. And the property testing has been a uh, designed to formalize this framework. And in particular, in property testing, what we want to do is we'd like to take as an input a graph and say, accept the graph if the graph satisfies some property. For example, it's planar. Or reject the graph, it is far from satisfying that property. So we don't want to just say planar, non-planar. We want to say, OK, planar or far from being planar. And yesterday, Ron E. Trubinfeld gave some uh, general exposition, what does it mean in the context of property testing to study these properties, and what is the reasoning, what is the motivation. Uh, so here is kind of more precise framework. So we want to take as an input a graph, as an input a property. And if the graph satisfies property, we want to say, OK, we want to pass it. If the input is epsilon far from satisfying the property, then we want to say that we want to reject it. And in addition to that, we allow some error. So with probability, say, one third or one quarter, we are allowed to err. OK? So in particular, if the graph is neither satisfied the property or is not far away, we, to some extent, don't care what is the answer. Uh, now, here a few formal issues. So what does it mean, notion of this epsilon far? Uh, we want to measure the distance from graphs satisfying a property. And he was saying a graph is epsilon far from satisfying a property if a change of epsilon fraction of the input is required to transform the graph into one that satisfies the property. OK? And here we usually will assume epsilon is a small constant, like, for example, 1.1. So epsilon is usually, you should think it's a constant, but it's a small constant. Uh, then the next thing is, in this talk, we, in property testing, we want to distinguish between algorithms which have two-sided error. So this algorithm is two-sided error algorithm. And one-sided error algorithms. One-sided never errs in this case. So if the graph has property, it will always want to satisfy. It will always want to return true. Uh, one of useful properties of this is that one-sided error, uh, error algorithms, they often, if the graph is epsilon far from satisfying the property, 
they often can return a certificate that the graph is far. Okay, so this is the model. Uh, and now, so we have the model. We have to formalize what does it mean that the graph is epsilon far from satisfying the property, or in other words, epsilon fraction of it, its representation is needed to obtain graph satisfying the property. Uh, and the most natural model, and actually the first model that people study, is the model of adjacency matrix. So the input is defined by 0, 1 matrix, n by n, corresponding to n, uh, to graph with n vertices. In this case, uh, epsilon far means we have to modify an epsilon fraction of entries in this graph to obtain a graph satisfying given property. In other words, oh, sorry. And he will assume that this graph is given us an oracle. So in every step, we can ask a question, OK, is edge i, uh, sorry, is vertex i connected uh, to vertex j? Uh, in this model, if you look at the definition, epsilon fraction of the entire matrix means we're allowed to modify epsilon n square edges in the graph. OK, so this is the model. And here's kind of, once again, repetition. What we want to study is we want to study the complexity of tester, which is the number of entries the algorithm will, of the adjacency matrix the algorithm will query. OK. So let's just start with very basic problem. Actually, two basic problems. So we are given some huge graph. And we want to see if the graph, the property, does a graph so it has a triangle. or does the graph is triangle free? So the first thing, does the graph has a triangle? It is a very simple property testing algorithm. Why this is the case? Because we are allowed to modify epsilon n square edges, we can make every graph to has a triangle. We just have to add three edges. So in this case, the question should be always yes. However, if we want to see if the graph is triangle free, this is a completely different game. And actually, some deep combinatorics has been used to show that we can also test this property very quickly. So we can test it in time f of epsilon, where epsilon, we said, is a constant. So in this case, this means in a constant time. We can just, in constant time, test if graph is uh, triangle-free or epsilon far from triangle-free. Excuse me? We'll come to this later, and that's an excellent point. Uh, so then the next thing is one of the first observations that people made when, under, when analyzing this type of uh, algorithms. They observed that all algorithms can be of the following very simple form. You just randomly sample some set of vertices. Then you look at the graph induced by these vertices. And if the graph satisfies a property, you accept it. If the graph doesn't satisfy the property, you reject it. And all testing algorithms can be described in this form. Uh, and this can be done with just quadratic loss of the speed. So if you have an algorithm of this form and you know its time is t and you know you cannot have faster algorithms of this form, then there is no other testing algorithm which would be faster than root of t. Yes? Query complexity. So number of cells was... Uh, Yes. So we are only, uh, the, com the entire complexity is just the number of entries in the matrix we've been testing. Uh, and, and by the way, here is also one thing. For example, this property doesn't have to be the same as the original property, but it's technical issue. OK. Uh, now, there are very fast algorithms, uh, very fast property testing. And as you have seen, all of them are very simple. So for example, for testing by partedness, we can ensure that all our algorithms can be of this very simple form. Sample set of vertices, check if the induced graph is bipartite. If it is, accept it. If it's not, reject it. What is the only thing that we want to understand here is what is the size of the sample set of vertices? Uh, and here, so there were some papers. First, someone showed that one can do it in time with the sample size of size poly, poly of 1 over epsilon. And then it was improved to O star of 1 over epsilon. Well, for your information, I'll be using this notation star to hide logarithmic terms. So this is 1 over epsilon times polylog of 1 over epsilon. And once we have this size of u, the complexity is always square of that. 
Because here we are just looking at number of vertices. And if we want to look at the graph induced by these vertices, the complexity will be u, u squared. OK. Uh, so for many years, people were trying to study all kinds of properties. And then came a very general result. Alan and Shapira show that all hereditary properties can be tested in constant time, assuming epsilon is a constant. Uh, and this is even with one-sided error. What are hereditary properties? These are all properties uh, which hold even if we remove vertices. So being bipartite, k, k colorable, etc. Uh, and the main idea here was this very simple lemma, which is essentially saying that if graph is epsilon far from uh, satisfying some hereditary property, then with, high, with constant probability, with probability 99%, uh, a random subgraph of size which depends only on epsilon uh, will not satisfy property P. So somehow we have this big graph, for example, triangle freeness is hereditary property. So we have the bound that if we just randomly sample some constant number of entries or vertices in the graph and look at the graph induced by it, we'll find a triangle if the graph, original graph was epsilon far from triangle freeness. Uh, and this was obtained by the use of a uh, similar dilemma. And actually, for example, it can be extended to hypergraphs. So the same result also holds for hypergraphs. Uh, and then this, this gives us essentially precise characterization of all uh, properties testable in constant time uh, with one-sided error, because these are only hereditary properties to some extent. Uh, so this gives us full characterization. Now, one can actually extend this to also a double-sided, two-sided error. And then there is some slightly more uh, complicated description, but essentially graph properties testable in constant time, if only if testing can be reduced to something on some ready partitions. OK, so this is what people were doing for many years. Uh, and this final result was amazing. Uh, now, so we have very simple algorithms. Uh, we understand this model very well because we have almost complete characterization. What can be tested quickly? The main problem is really the dependency on epsilon. And the running time, of, the running time generated by this Alan uh, Shapira result was of this form. So this is 2 to 2, and you just do it many, many times to 1 over epsilon. So the precise characterization is that if we define tower of C like that, so you just do 2 to 2 and you repeat this C times, uh, then the running time obtained by this general machinery of tower of tower of tower of 1 over epsilon. Uh, so once I computed, for epsilon equal to half, you'd have to write 65,000 times 2 to the power to obtain the power. So what does it mean? It is not really very practical bound. Uh, <laughs> still, there are some, so, so let, let's be positive. There are some properties when, when, when we can do much better. For example, by partedness, we can do it in time 1 over epsilon square. Uh, but for example, in this problem of checking if graph is triangle free, the best currently known bound is tower of 1 over epsilon. And for many years, actually, people conjectured that this is the lower bound. Now, actually, some people are, people are not sure. This is related to so-called triangle removal lemma, which is people has, have been studying for many years. And recently, there was some progress. So there is actually a chance that one can beat this bound. But for now, just if you want to check if graph is triangle free, you have this horrendous time. OK. Uh, so we do have some problems in this model. The first, I mean, the biggest problem is perhaps uh, that the dependency on epsilon is really quite big. Uh, and the second problem is that we are here requiring the distance from the property to be epsilon n square. So if you have some kind of typical big graph, which is usually sparse, the distance epsilon square is really too big. So you can try to remove, you can try to reduce the distance. You can try to take epsilon, not necessarily to be a constant, 
say go to 1 over n or something like that. But then this dependency on epsilon would kill us. So on one hand, we have a beautiful characterization of this model. On the other hand, there are some problems why it is difficult for you to do anything about it. OK, so once we, we, we have seen this model, and this was the main model in property testing for 15 years, perhaps. Uh, let's just think what to do with other models. So the next na most natural model is adjacency list. Or if, in other words, so you are given a graph. Here you have set of vertices. Each vertex knows its neighbors. Uh, and we have a query which is, so you can pick a vertex and say, tell me what is the ith neighbor of that vertex. Uh, in this case, the distance is defined as, OK, we can modify epsilon times uh, number of edges, uh, edges in this con uh, to obtain graph, which is epsilon far. Uh, so this is suitable for sparse graph. It's suitable for any graphs. Uh, the main model that people have been studying, though, was the model of bounded graphs. So graphs with maximum degree d, where d is a constant. The reason is that then you can really think that you know, this adjacency list is, I can just in constant time check everything with all my neighbors. So this is kind of the most natural model. It's still not the most general, but it's to some extent the most natural model. Uh, and then quite often, would us, instead of using this bound for epsilon times e, we are just saying we are allowed to modify epsilon dn edges. OK. So in this model, uh, maximum degree d, first information is we don't have such strong links to combinatorics. Here we are using slightly different set of tools. And main, of, main tools are random sampling, local search, and random walks. And I will try to give you some examples of the use of these tools here. OK, so first we want to study perhaps the most basic question of testing connectivity. So we are given a graph, we want to see if it's connected or not, or it's epsilon far from being connected. Uh, so we have to understand what does it mean that the graph is epsilon far from being connected. And this, it's easy to see, means that the graph has lots of connected components. Uh, this per se, it's not enough to really understand, to, to come up with an efficient algorithm. But if we have lots of connected components, we can actually see that many of them will be small. So we have a good number uh, of small connected components. So we have at least epsilon times dn half connected components of size of that sort. And once we have it, what we are doing, we randomly sample vertices. We check if this vertex is in a small connected component. And if it is, we know this graph is epsilon far from being connected. OK, so here's an algorithm. We randomly sample some set of vertices. We then run BFS or any algorithm which is just checking is this graph in a small connected component or not? So if you run BFS and you see that the connected component is big, you just stop. But if you have a graph which is epsilon far from being uh, connected, you know you have lots of small connected components. So you know that one of these randomly chosen vertices will be in such connected component. And then you will just detect it quickly. So with this, you can come up with a testing connectivity algorithm in this run. So this is a very basic algorithm, which actually is showing us that even some global properties can be tested in this model very quickly. Uh, then the next thing is testing edge freeness. So before we have seen that you know testing triangle freeness is a complicated task. We can do it in constant time, but the time is enormous. Here the problem is much easier. So if graph is epsilon far from triangle free, we can easily show it has lots of disjoint triangles, and so randomly random sampling, so you just randomly sample vertices, and then you just see, is this vertex in a triangle or not? And again, because these are constant, so these are constant degree graphs, you can easily do it in constant time. So with this, we would like to also do the same thing as we did before, understand which properties will have constant time algorithms. And then we move to the next property, which seems to be very basic, uh, bipartitness. And then things are complicated. So for testing bipartitness, there was a very nice algorithm running in time essentially root of n by Goldrich and Ron. And the algorithm was as follows. 
So this algorithm was randomly sampling some set of vertices, and then for each vertex algorithm it was doing the following. Run root of n random walks of logarithmic length. Okay? So essentially run so many random walks, essentially root of n, and each random walk is of length log n. And if one of these random walks will find that we have an odd length cycle, which is, which is a proof that the graph is not bipartite, then we just return, uh, say no. If all of these random walks will find that all the cycles found are of even lengths, then we'll return yes. Uh, and the main idea here is that if graph is really far away from bipartite, then we'll be able to find lots of short cycles of odd length. And these cycles we, did, we, we can detect using random walks and random sampling. Uh, the proof is quite complicated. There are kind of two different cases. One if, if the graph is an excellent expander, and then things are easy. And another is if the graph is not expanded, and then one has to do something. Uh, so this was one thing, which was, OK, so we have algorithm running in run time root of n. Can we do better? And Goldrush and Ron show that we cannot really do it better. Uh, so there is a lower bound of root of n, which is essentially uh, focusing everything on distinguishing between two types of instances. So in both instances, we first start with Hamiltonian cycle. And then in one, we take a random matching. And this random matching will have lots of odd length cycles. And then random matching, but without odd length cycles, which will not generate odd length cycles. And one can prove that one needs root of n time to distinguish between these two instances. Uh, OK, so the bad news is we don't have constant time algorithms, even for kind of basic properties. Uh, then. The extension of bipartiteness to color colorability is three colorability. And here there was even worse bound. Uh, so Bogdanov and Bata Trevisan showed that essentially to test this property, one has to test an entire graph. So the running time is essentially linear. So this shows a big discrepancy between this type of this model and the previous model, where we can do lots of things in constant time, even though constant was huge. Here we can we need to spend more time. Uh, then I want to tell you something about testing some basic properties. Uh, first, let's just think about acyclicity. So we want to check if a graph is a forest or not. Uh, and here again, I want to show you that there is a big difference between one-sided error and two-sided error. Uh, so two-sided error is much easier. So if we want to test if graph is a forest, the following algorithm will do it easily. So we first look at the graph, we estimate the number of edges. Then we look at the graph, we estimate the number of com connected components. And there is a well-known formula which put them together in the case of forest. So if there's a forest, the formula must hold. Otherwise, we just reject the graph. Uh, if one implemented properly, one can get the running time of this side, of this cell. Uh, what about one-sided error? And then the story is similar to bipartiteness. We cannot do it much better. So the first thing is, uh, there is a lower bound by gold rush and drone, the same as for bipartiteness, which is root of n. And there is also an upper bound, uh, where we can show that we can solve it in time root of n. Uh, and I will show you the, the, the construction, because I think it's one of cute constructions here. I, I'm, I, so I don't really have many proofs. This is perhaps the only reconstruction that I will show you. So we want to test, by, uh, we want to test uh, whether the graph is a forest or not, so whether we have cyclists or not. We'll reduce it to the problem of bipartiteness. How we'll do it? So we take a graph, and now on each edge, with probability half, we'll put another vertex. So, OK. So each, so we just choose, so for every edge, we just, with probability half, we just put a new vertex in the middle. And now the claim is, if the original graph had cycles, okay, this graph will have lots of cycles of odd length. And with this, we'll be able to detect it 
using bipartitness test. Uh, so we have the first observation. If the original graph was cycle free, then the obtained graph is, obtained graph is also cycle free. So of course it won't be, it will be bipartite. Otherwise, the claim is it will have lots, it will be epsilon far from bipartite. And with this, we can use the tester of Goldbrush and Rohn. Okay, so this is what we'll do. Uh, the next thing is, oh, sorry, uh, good. The next thing is, uh, we're studying the extension of this. So here we wanted to find if you have a cycle. What about having, say, uh, being say CK minor free? which means that we don't have any cycle of length at most. Uh, having no cycle of length at least k. Uh, and we can extend our bound and also show that in this case we can also get root of a runtime. And furthermore, we can actually make it algorithmic. So this is because we have one-sided error problem. So we can show that if graph is epsilon far, from say k, c k minor three, then we can find a long cycle in this graph. Uh, okay, and then we can also show that actually, these bounds of root of k again are tied. So we can show that for any fixed graph H that contains a simple cycle, uh, testing minor H freeness requires at least root of n time. We can actually extend it further. Uh, we can also show some complementary result. Show that if you take any tree, then testing minor t freeness can be done in constant time. And what, what does it mean, really? We can come up with the following general result, that if we want to te test if a graph is h minor free, then we can test it in constant time if only if H doesn't have cycle. And if H has a cycle, we need at least root of n time. Okay, so what did, what did I try to tell you? I wanted to show you that some very basic properties, like bipartitness, uh, H freeness, originally in the first model, we could have test them in constant time. Here we need root of n time and the algorithms are more sophisticated analysis, perhaps more complicated. Uh, then let's just think about the next possible big problem. We have a big graph and we want to understand, is this graph planar? Uh, and there was a beautiful result by Benjamin Ishram Shapira, who showed that with two-sided error, we can test this property in constant time. So, you know, bipartitness we cannot test, but planarity we can test which is kind of surprising. Now, there is even something more surprising. Uh, so, there are some graphs, and you can think about simple expander, regular expander, uh, where if you take, yes? Bounded degree, yes. Uh, so, it is easy to see that there are graphs which are epsilon far from being planar. And if you look at any constant size connected subgraph, they are planar. A good example here are exa expanders. Let's say three regular expanders. We know that they will have Gerth logarithmic. So somehow these graphs are as far from, uh, from planar as possible. But if you look at any constant size subgraph, they are planar. So to some extent, this result is, is quite surprising. And the main idea, really, what they were doing is that even though, you know, if you look at any constant size graph, it will be planar, you look at the shape of this constant size graphs. And you can see that if graph is epsilon far from planar, you will have very different structure. This was, so this led to an algorithm with such a running time. So this was still not good. But this was later improved to time, uh, which was 2 to poly of 1 over epsilon by Hasidim et al. Uh, and they had simpler analysis, simpler algorithm, uh, which was really using the fact that if graph is epsilon far from planar, that it either has lots of constant sized non planar subgraphs, or it has lots of small subgraphs. 
we found good separator, which look, which look like expander. And then recently this was improved even further, and the currently best bound here is 2 to O of log square 1 of uh, 1 over epsilon. So this is not polynomial of in 1 over epsilon, but just slightly super polynomial. Uh, okay, so this is two-sided error. What about one-sided error? And here the story is easy. It is easy to see that we cannot do anything in time better than root of n. So as before, here we have constant time for, si for two-sided error, root of n time at best for a uh, one-sided error. Uh, now, this is not only for planar graphs. So one can easily extend it to every minor clause property. Uh, so this really goes beyond just planar graphs. Uh, then we have seen that if, if a graph is good, exp a good uh, if a graph is planar, has good separators, then we can quickly, efficiently test properties of this graph. What about if graph is, doesn't have good separators? It's an expander. Uh, so in expanders, the intuition was the testing properties might be hard, and this was, this led to the start of this problem. Can we distinguish between graphs which are good expanders and graphs which are poor expanders? And here was a paper where, so it was known that you need, that we need at least root of n time. And he was shown that actually we can test this property in root of n time. Uh, now, here's the algorithm. And the algorithm in my opinion is very nice. So one randomly sample vertices, and then from each vertex, from each sample vertex, one run root of n random walks of logarithmic length. Now, what we are doing then, we're looking only at the end nodes of these random walks. And we're counting how many of these end nodes repeat. And now, why do we do it? So, it is well known that if input graph is an expander, and we run random walk, that will end up at a random node. So, in the first case, if a graph is a good expander, we can easily estimate how many collisions we'll have, because this will be just random nodes. So the key part here is to say, if graph is epsilon far from expander, then we'll have many more collisions that one can formalize. Mm. In the previous result, I was just assuming the input graph is arbitrary. Right now, I would like to show you very briefly that we can also study properties of special classes of graphs for example, of planar graphs. And the good thing is, in planar graphs, life is much easier, as we should expect. Uh, so, the first thing is, so we have seen that in arbitrary graphs, testing by partitness requires root of n time. In planar graphs, we can do it in constant time. Uh, and the following very simple algorithm is doing it. Randomly sample vertices, then look at the neighborhood of constant size, and if you see it, uh, if everything is bipartite, bipartite in, that expa in that neighborhood, you accept the graph. If at least once you found an odd length cycle, you reject the graph. Uh, and one can come up with a complexity of this sort. So this simple graph kind of doing random sampling and then doing some like BFS will do the job. And in, in fact, one can show that the same idea can be extended not just to bipartiteness, but to all hereditary properties. We can show that testing any hereditary property can be done in the same way, in constant time. You randomly sample some constant number of vertices, then you do, you look at the ball of constant size. If the graph satisfies the property, you accept. If the graph doesn't satisfy in at least one of the copies, you just reject it. Uh, okay, so. Mm. Then, actually, this can be expanded beyond planar graphs. So the only property that is really essential here is that the graphs have good, separa good separators. So we can say that the same algorithms will work for non-expanding families of graphs. And it, this was formalized by the notion of hyperfinite graphs, which are exactly graphs which have good separator properties. Uh, 
And this was kind of finalized in a beautiful result by Newman and Zoller, who showed that testing any property in hyperfinite graphs uh, can be done in constant time. This algorithm, though, is non uniform. So, what does it mean? General graphs, we may be very, very slow, which means root of n time. In planar graphs or graphs with good separation, we can do things in constant time. Uh, the next, the final somehow big topic I would like to tell you is how to deal with graphs which are not bounded degree. Uh, that I would have to think, please. No, no, I, I, I would have to. I, I still would like to finish it sometime, but I'm going to come up back. Uh, so the next thing is, we want to study graphs which not necessarily have bounded degree. And in this model, the problem is completely different. So here, for example, if we want to test planarity, it doesn't matter one-sided, two-sided error, we need root of n time. And a, pro and a counter example is as follows. One example is take a, an empty graph, no vertices, okay? Then of course you will always say yes. And on the other hand, take a graph which, where you have a clique of size root of n, and then the remaining vertices are of degree zero. Any algorithm in the model I just described to you will require root of n time to distinguish between these two cases. Uh, so what can we say about this model without bound for the maximum degree? Uh, so here we have so many edges that we have to modify. And we'll consider the model where we have either one of these two properties. So either we can ask for the ith neighbor or we can ask for the maximum degree because otherwise we would be bounded by the maximum degree, which could be huge. Or we can also consider a model with random neighbor of any vertex. So in any step we can say, give me a random neighbor of a vertex. Uh, and the main, the main difference between this model and the previous model is that here we cannot really do graph exploration quickly. Running BFS, you can have one vertex with degree n, so just running BFS would be extremely expensive for anything. Uh, so you have to deal with other type of properties. And here we have one result which, to some extent, perhaps the only non-trivial result, which is testing in planar graphs. Well, we have shown that testing by partedness in planar graphs can be done in constant time. And the algorithm is quite simple. Uh, we run many random walks, and all of them are co in, of constant size. And we claim if the graph is not bipartite, then one of the random walks will spot this fact. So furthermore, we can extend this beyond planar graphs. We can deal with all graphs of excluded minor, forbidden minor. Uh, and we have also some partial result about extension beyond bipartiteness. Okay. Uh, so, what I wanted to present to you today is that once we have big graphs and all what we want to do is we have to deal with sublinear algorithms, then on one hand, I mean, we have to study these problems because this is what, what we have to deal nowadays. For some problems, we can come up with very quick algorithms. For some others, for, to test some other properties, we have some natural lower bounds. Uh, still, understanding of testing properties in graphs, especially in graphs with bounded degree model adjacency lists, or even more arbitrary graphs in adjacency lists, our knowledge is very patchy. So here's kind of short summary of the results that we have here. In the JSS matrix model, we have complete characterization. Still, the algorithms are not as practical as they should be. In a JSS list model, we have some basic characterizations, but lots of questions are still open. And we, we also know that for graph without expanding properties, lots of properties can be tested very quickly. Uh, but graphs with no bound for the degree, very little is known, and we still need to understand this model. And I still, in my opinion, actually, this is the most natural model we should think of. So what to do in a graph when we don't have any bound for the degree? You may have some vertices with huge degrees, some with very low degree. 
we can access adjacency lists, which is the most natural representation. What can we test quickly? Uh, and there are still some other models which are worth study, but which I haven't mentioned here. Is what to do with directed graphs? What to do with uh, graphs where instead of adjacency lists, we have other accesses to the input. For example, we can take random edge. And also, what can we say about graphs when, way, uh, when the edges have some weights? But there is still lots of open problems, research problems here. And I believe that if we want to understand big data, big graphs, we must think about problems, how to understand, how to tackle the properties of graphs in big graphs. Thank you.